Hillary forgot to mention one thing. <laughs> we were at college together. <laughs> 33 years ago. <laughs> it's wonderful to be sharing a stage with her again from our old performing arts days. But I'm here to talk about time. How many times have you said that you would do something when the time is right? Well, the truth of the matter is, the time is always right. And right now, in our world, there has never been a better time to be out. And I'm not talking about Brexit. <laughs> I've been with my partner for 19 years. For 10 of those years, we've been civil partners. And just recently, I'm now happy to say that I can call her my wife. Thank you. And the reason we've achieved that is because we're of the generation of people who never stopped coming out. Sometimes I have to come out on a daily basis, sometimes a couple of times a day. And that's not just because I like declaring my sexuality at every opportune moment. No, it's just everyday life. You know, I might set up a new bank account. I might register with a new dentist. Anything. My favorite, checking in at a hotel. <laughs> I've booked a lovely double room with a double bed for me and the wife. And we arrive, only to find that the hotel has taken it upon themselves to change our booking to a twin-bedded room, <laughs> on the assumption that same-sex names means friends. And we have clearly made a mistake with our booking. Recently, I had to go through a spate of medical treatment, which resulted in a few stays in hospitals. And let me tell you, it was all gynecological stuff, so I cannot begin to tell you how many times I had to come out. <laughs> <sighs> and on one of these days, I was there lying in my hospital bed, and my partner was with me when we were still civil partners. This was just before we upgraded to marriage. And the nurse came along, and she's filling out one of the many forms. And uh, then all of a sudden, she looks up, and she said, and who's this? Is this your friend? And I said, uh, no, this is my partner. And with that, she stumbled and stuttered and went, oh, 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 oh well, a friend, partner, same thing, and scurried off. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I don't tend to have sex with my friends. <laughs> something in the heterosexual world I may have missed. <laughs> but then I read a survey from Stonewall that came out in 2015 that said over half of health and social care practitioners did not think that sexual orientation played any part in someone's health care needs. The survey also disclosed that one in ten of these practitioners had overheard colleagues saying that being gay can be cured. I was interested in that bit because I'm 57 and I haven't been cured yet. <laughs> I was wondering whether I could uh, qualify for signing on long-term sick. <laughs> I think this is gonna hang around quite a few years, don't you? These statistics, it's not surprising that now, in 2016, nearly half of all lesbians are not out to their GPs. It's astonishing. Coming out takes courage. And each day, I have to find that courage if I want to continue to truly be who I am. These ordinary, innocuous situations for heterosexual people can, for gay people, be fraught with anxiety. That split-second moment, think about it, that split-second moment before you give an answer that will out you, 
is filled with the fear of a thousand judgments that can flood their way into your head, creating a potential tsunami of shame. Part of my shame manifested itself in managing the reactions of others, making it okay for them. I felt apologetic that I had made them feel awkward and that somehow it was my responsibility to alleviate that. I'm feeling very emotional about this, so um, you'll have to forgive my, my hesitation. But through all of this, I still chose, and I still choose, to come out. I have a wonderful gay cousin, and uh, just recently we were celebrating his marriage. And at his party, we were sharing stories. And he said to me that at the age of 13 in 1963, he had come to the conclusion that for him, being gay meant that he must be a criminal. And then I shared with him for the first time, I'd never told him this, that for me in 1972, when I was 13, that what I was thinking and feeling must have meant that I was mentally ill. Now you have to remember we lived in a time that was pre-gay soap stars, it was pre-gay pop stars, we didn't have any coming out on YouTube. We had nothing of that. We could see nothing in the world that reflected our lives back at us. We lived a life of secrets and that became our norm. And, you know, in fact, if any town or city did have a gay club back then, it usually was called Secrets. <laughs> and it was downstairs in a bar or in the back room of a pub, tucked away. Even today, you do know that the only sex, uh, sex shop for lesbians in London is called Shh. <laughs> it's true, it's in Old Street, you can go and find it. You can take men by invitation. So there we were at his party celebrating, but sharing our battle scars. We're sharing our battle scars of living through the comments, the stares, the disgust, the hatred. It was a, a constant drip feed of microaggressions that has seeped into our bodies over the years. But you know, throughout all of this, we both said that out of all of the achievements in our lives, and I'm really proud to say that my cousin is a world-renowned harpsichordist, out of all of the achievements in our lives, coming out is still the biggest. I was recently really impacted by a documentary I watched on Martina Navratilova called Just Call Me Martina. Anybody else see that? Fantastic documentary. But I was sitting there watching it, and she was talking about how, until recently, she felt less than everybody else because she wasn't allowed to marry the person she loved. I'm watching this documentary thinking, oh my God, this is Martina. She's won 59 Grand Slam titles, you know? This woman's amazing, and yet, even she felt less than everyone else because she couldn't marry the person she loved. But now she can, and it's because of the persistence of our generation of coming out that we were able to change the laws and get that equality. But let's not confuse equality with equity, because while we have now gained legal representation and legal equality in many, many areas. Can we really say that we live in a world where we are allowed to fully participate regardless of our sexuality? I'm not quite so sure yet. 
Because even with these small steps, really, for heterosexuals, but huge, giant leaps for queer kind, we still have some ways to go. Coming out is not a one-time deal. It's a lifetime commitment of courage. You see, our sexuality is not just about sex. It's about how I see, meet, feel, and touch the world. And more importantly for me, it's about how the world meets, sees, feels, and touches me back. So until the time, and you know that thing you said you were going to do in your head when the time is right? Just do it. Because for me, until the time comes when the 26% of our lesbian and gay and bisexual and transsexual workers who don't feel safe coming out at work can come out, until the time comes when the 72 countries that still punish homosexuality and where it's still illegal change their laws, and the 10 countries that punish homosexuality with the death penalty stop, until the time comes when the 34% of young LGBT people are not attempting suicide, and 51% of them not self-harming in the UK today. Until the time comes when all LGBT people do not have to endure the use of the word gay pejoratively. Until this time, and more, and maybe into a world where we don't even have to bother coming out, it is just accepted. Until this time, I and my beautiful wife will keep coming out. Thank you.